Well, good morning. And if there are any youth parents in here, I promise you, I didn't spend the whole weekend yelling at your kids like that. Gosh, when they choose those clips, I just sit there, and first it's already cringe to hear your own voice, and then it's like, man, who was I mad at? My goodness. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was a great weekend. Now, I have to say, this is, is the, the 1030 service, the, these are my people. The nine, they're, they're so saved. They get up early and do their devotionals and different things, and <laughs> they're probably at home cutting the grass or something. They're so responsible. You know, they, 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 uh, they catch the early game. You know, they, they, there's just so much that they're doing already. They're so accomplished. Uh, you guys watched one more episode before bed last night. <laughs> you know, you, you, you had the dessert. You know, you, 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 you were okay with extending the night. Um, we're not even gonna talk about 12. They have breakfast and lunch before they come to church, so <laughs> we'll just leave them alone. But this, they, these are my people here. I, I know some of you guys came in here with, uh, you know, strollers and different things. This is the young kid crowd. So I, 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 you mind if I'm comfortable with you guys, with you being my people, 1030, is that okay? All right, I'm gonna be comfortable. I do, I do wanna show honor. I think honor is so important. Honor is, if, if I don't do anything else, uh, this morning here in front of you, I wanna honor the word of God and I wanna honor the leaders of the house. And, and I'm so grateful for what has been built here uh, by Pastor Josh and Brenda. This is, is such an incredible house. And, and, and what I said in the, in the morning, and I wanna say it again, is, is you all as, as worshipers, as leaders, as teams, as, as students, you are such a great reflection of the leadership of this house. And, and, and I'm gonna ask you if you don't mind, even though they're not here today, can we honor your lead pastors just here in this moment? <laughs> Pastor Josh, if you ever watch this, thanks, man. Love you, bro. And uh, it would, I would be remiss not to honor uh, the people who, who gave me the opportunity to come and speak this, this weekend. And they are incredible young leaders. They, they love students uh, so well. They're, they're some of the hardest working people I've seen in ministry. In fact, I haven't seen them much because they serve everywhere all the time. And, and I love them. They have become uh, such good friends so fast. And, and that's Pastor Justin and Lex Fryer. They are incredible. I don't know if they're in here, but thank you so much for this opportunity. So I, I wanna dive into the word. I, I, I had a chance to kind of peek into uh, some of your guys' uh, recent series. The, the Freedom, Freedom series has been absolutely incredible. Your, your pastor is brilliant. And, and I'm thinking it's gonna be really hard to come speak on, on this platform that he, that he speaks on. And then you bring in this little lady named Bianca and she's absolutely incredible too. And I'm like, man, here comes this little youth pastor from Arizona. I just, I just really hope that I can serve you guys well with the word, but I'm gonna do my very best as long as you guys are willing to lean in with me. Is that all right? We're gonna do it. And, and if it's your second time, I said this in the first, but it's very true. If it's your second time here, I promise the lead pastor does preach. You know, you, you had her and then you had me and it just keeps getting darker, but I think he's gonna preach pretty soon, all right? So he's, he's coming back. If you don't mind, let's open the word to Psalm 68. Psalm 68. Psalm 68. This actually stems from a, a youth series we did months ago back home in Arizona. And um, I was gonna get into it later, but I'm gonna just say it now. It, it was interesting that as we dove into this topic, as we started studying uh, what was going on with teens, and we did research, and we prayed, and we, we discussed, and, and, and did everything we could in terms of our preparation, we realized it's, it's definitely a topic that's also dealt with uh, with other generations, whether it's younger or older than the millennials and Gen Z that we preach to. So, so this, is, this is definitely a genera generational message that stemmed from a youth series. And Psalm 68, I'm gonna start in verse four, and it says this. It says, sing praises to God and to his name. Sing loud praises to him who rides the clouds. His name is the Lord. Rejoice in his presence. Father to the fatherless, defender of widows, this is God whose dwelling is holy. God places the lonely in families. God places the lonely in families. God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free and gives them joy, but he makes the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land which is a bit offensive for someone who lives in Arizona. So I don't know if I'm rebellious or what happened there, but that's home for me. Now, I question, any other paper Bibles in the house? Any other? Hold it up. If you, oh, look at that family there. There we go, there we go, there we go. You guys are beating the Super Save 9 because they had a combined one, I believe. Uh, but I want to say this. I love using uh, my holy iPhone for, for Bible reading plans and different things. And I know when you come to church, you can use your phone or the iPhone 30. We'll put the verses up there and different things. But, but, but I do want to say this. Sometimes I open up my phone to read my Bible, and there's a notification that bothers me. 
or there's a pop-up of a text that, that leads me to thinking about work, or, or I get distracted and start looking at the wrong things, or I sit there and realize I, I opened, it, opened it up to do one thing, and next thing I know, 40 minutes later, I'm stuck doing, I'm nine non-even friends deep on Instagram or something like, oh, that's where they live. You know, it's just, I'm just so, somewhere so far from where I'm supposed to be when I'm digging into my word, and, and sometimes I, I, I read things on my phone, and it's like, man, that's bad news. I've never opened this up and seen bad news. I've never opened this up and got distracted. When I, when I read through here, it's only good news. It's only edifying. And, and, I, and I challenge you, if you're willing, to, to have yourself a, a paper Bible because, uh, as we all know, the Bible is the only book that was ever created that you can read but also reads you. So I'm going I'm to dive in. So Psalm 68, we read that. And if you're, if you're taking notes, this, this message is called Help, I'm Lonely. Help. I'm lonely. Now, you guys have been dealing with a lot of different uh, topics during the Freedom Series, and, and then Pastor Bianca came and, and talked a lot about friendship with God and, and some of the beautiful things that you can have in relationship with God. But, but I want to dig deep just on the one topic of loneliness, only because as we've done our research and as we studied and as we prayed, we began to understand that loneliness in itself is probably more reported now than ever before, even though we have more access to each other than ever before. We have more resources to where, I mean, Speaking of phones, you ever, you ever open up your phone and you have an, from the same person an email, a DM, and a text like, where are you? And it's like, man, just hit me up once and, and, and just wait for me to, to, to get to you. You know, people, people have way too much access to us and we have way too much access to people. But how is it that for some reason we still have uh, this, this condition where we can still become so lonely? And I want to say something. I didn't say this in the nine, but I want to make something clear. Loneliness didn't happen as a result of the pandemic. But a lot of that stuff was brought to the surface. And I, want to, I just want to dig into that just, just for a bit. And, and as we did our research and as we prayed and as we looked through it, this is, this is one statement that we really uh, came to understand is that uh, loneliness, first of all, is not predictable. Yes, you, you can, you can uh, be alone and not be lonely, and you can be lonely and not be alone. You see, I, I've, I've met widows who live absolutely by themselves, who have no more and, and greater community now than they ever have before. And then I've also had conversations and seen the research where they talk about some uh, married people who have a house full of kids and they sleep in the same bed as their spouse every single night and they're in the most lonely season of their life. It's not always predictable. And why is that? It's because loneliness is a condition and not a position. Loneliness is a condition from the inside and not a position you're in in life. I think this stems all the way back to the beginning of time. It stems all the way back to uh, the beginning, the first couple, Adam and Eve, all the way back in Genesis chapter one. And, and, we, and we read, in, in the, if, you're, if you're new to the Bible, Genesis chapter one talks about the, the creation and, and, and the first couple, Adam was the, the first man and, and from him came Eve. And what we see is that it, that's the only era, the only time in history where the earth actually was in perfection. That garden, that beautiful place was perfection. Adam and Eve had everything they would ever want and need. They had uh, responsibilities, they had love, they had companionship, they, they had uh, even proper and healthy restrictions. They had everything they would ever need. But the enemy snuck in and convinced Eve that she had a lack. You know, if you think about sin, there's a lot of ways you can describe sin, and you can, you can say there are a lot of things about, about sin. Where does it stem from? But, but one thing that we can definitely highlight is that for, for Eve, it stemmed from a perceived lack because, you see, they had everything they ever wanted and needed, but the enemy was able to convince her that there was something that she needed greater than what she had there, a perceived lack. It wasn't a true lack, but a perceived lack. And I want to highlight a few perceived lacks that land us in this condition of loneliness. And the first one is this, a perceived lack of acceptance. A perceived lack of acceptance. They don't want me there. I'm too good for that group of bad. I'm too bad for that group of good. I'm too saved for those ones and too heathen for those ones. I'm too, I can't afford to hang out in that group. I haven't been in the church long enough to serve in that group. This perceived lack of acceptance. I don't dress the way they do. And you begin to convince yourself that you're not accepted in a group, that you're not accepted in this church, you're not accepted in that social function, you're not accepted in this family that you're marrying into because it's all perceived. 
lack of acceptance, and it lands you in a condition of loneliness. Second one is this, a lack of attention, a perceived lack of attention. You don't have to confess it, but do you ever find yourself in a position saying, man, does anybody see what I'm accomplishing? Man, it's, it's lonely here. I thought I was doing well. I'm giving all I have. I thought I was serving well. I thought I was working well. I thought I was producing well. I thought I was loving well. I thought I was, I was doing, but, but nobody seems to notice. Or even on the other hand, does anyone see how much I'm hurting? Does anyone see? I'm not getting the attention that I, that I, that I feel like I, I need, and, and, and your mind convinces you of that, and your heart convinces you of that, and you get in this condition of loneliness as a result of your perceived lack of attention. It's amazing how one of our Bible heroes even found himself in one of those positions. John the Baptist. John the Baptist is is, is someone that we read about in the New Testament. And if you're new to the Bible, John the Baptist is, is, is the one that was actually prophesied about. And, and, and John the Baptist was full of the, the, the spirit of God even before his natural birth. And they, they called him a voice in the wilderness. And the voice in the wilderness. And he, he was the one who said, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And, and, and as Jesus was approaching, he said, behold, the, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll baptize you with water, but he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And I'm not even good enough to, to tie his, to, to strap his sandals, right? That, that's that John the Baptist. Anybody familiar with him? That John the Baptist, the strongest, he's actually the, 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 in the flesh, the cousin of Jesus, declaring the word of the Lord prophetically and power, powerfully. All of a sudden in Matthew chapter 11, finds himself in jail. And he allows that time in jail to land him in a condition of loneliness because he lacked the attention he believed he was supposed to get. How do we know that? Because this is what he said. The same voice that said, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He said this, are you the Messiah we've been expecting or should we look, be looking for someone else? From declaring the goodness of Jesus to saying, are you even the one? All because he found himself in a condition of loneliness there in that prison. Completely flipping his thoughts. Completely flipping the position of his heart. All because he didn't think he was getting the attention that he deserved. I declared your name. I preached your word. I baptized you and other people. And now, why am I sitting here in this prison? Why am I the one facing death? I love Jesus' answer. He says this, and Jesus is so gangster. Go back to John, like Jesus didn't even go. He said, you go tell him. Go back to John and tell him what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. Man, it's incredible what, what Jesus said to him. He said, don't let your condition make you in your heart and mind twist what my mission is. Your circumstance, my, my, my mission here, my reason for being on this earth is not based on your circumstances in the moment. I'm here to save the world. I'm not here just to, to pull you out of your circumstance every time you ask me to. My, my, my goodness is not based on your mood. My goodness isn't based on what you think I should be doing. My goodness is based on the mission that I'm here to carry out that my father sent me to do. But, Pat, but John, due to lack of attention, found himself in a condition of loneliness. The next one, lack of intimacy. Lack of intimacy. I know we're not going to have a purity talk again right now like we did with the youth on Saturday morning. But lack of intimacy, I mean, in, in terms of friendship. Feeling like you don't have those covenant relationships. Feeling like, uh, I don't know if you've anybody been there, to, to where you say, nobody really knows me. Nobody cares to really know me. And I don't feel like... Uh, there's anyone in my life that I can, that I can really uh, uh, get to know and talk to. When, when I, my, my father's my lead pastor, and there's, there's a phrase he always uses with our, with, our, with our teams and our leaders. He always says, you've got to have somebody that you can completely fall apart in front of. And there's some that are saying, I don't, I don't have that. And as a result of that lack of intimacy, you've landed yourself in a condition of loneliness. We okay? Everybody okay? We good? One person's good. All right, let's keep going. Yeah, just, just for the record, when pastors say, is this okay? It's because they're getting lonely on the stage. Uh, I'll be honest, all right? I was, in a, I was in a little condition of loneliness for a minute there. I wasn't hearing voices and, and you know, like I'm an Enneagram three, so I need like words of affirmation. Like, am I doing good? We okay, you know? So, all right, so let's keep going. The next one is lack of value. 
lack of value. I have nothing to offer. I don't have enough to offer. I don't have enough to give. What I have to give, who I am to give is not enough. A lack of value. Another one of our Bible heroes, the prophet Elijah, we see in 1 Kings chapter 18, oh my gosh, one of the greatest scenes, the, 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 the battle on Mount Carmel, if, you, if you've never read it, or caramel, depending who you are, the, ba- the battle up on the top of that mountain, and, 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 it's, and it's him against these, these people who, who, the prophets of Baal, and, and the prophets of Baal, they're, they're, they're ready to challenge him, and it becomes this, this, this battle between the power of our, our living God and, and the power of Baal, and let, they, they're on the top of this mountain, and they, they set up equal sacrifices, and, and they, say, they say, let's see who can call down fire. And these, 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 these prophets of Baal, they start doing all their, their rituals, cutting themselves and banging their heads on the floor and doing all kind of weird stuff. And, and no matter what they did, no matter how long they, they did it, nothing happened as a result of all of their rituals. Nothing happened. Fire never came. And then prophet Elijah, even he poured water on top of his, on top of his sacrifice and he made his sacrifice even uh, harder to accomplish than theirs. And he prayed a prayer to the Lord and he said, Lord, I want you to do this. Not so I can get the glory, but so the hearts can be turned to you and the fire comes down and completely consumes the sacrifice without him touching it, without, without, without a, a flame to start it, just the fire of God. Now, that's 1 Kings chapter 18. The very next chapter, in chapter 19, there's this woman, I'm not allowed to call her ratchet, but there's this woman, a terrible, absolutely horrible woman named Jezebel. And now Jezebel is, is, is after him, and she puts Elijah on the run. So this same Bible hero calling down fire, proving the power of God through his spoken word, is now alone and on the run and finds himself in a condition of loneliness. And what he says is this. I'm going to read it. He says, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as well as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba and belongs to the Judah. I'm sorry, and, and left his servant here. But this is where I'm going to, but verse four. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under the broom tree and he asked that he might die, saying, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life for I am no better than my father's. That condition of loneliness left him with this perceived lack of value. I'm no better than the ones that came before me. Yeah, I had the anointing. Yeah, I called down fire. Yeah, you used me in a miraculous way. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, maybe, maybe I can be used even to anoint the next generation and to carry it on and on. And yes, you, you spoke your word through me, but, but this lady Jezebel's after me and now I'm by myself, so just, can you just kill me? This perceived lack of value. The next one. And the last of the lacks, these perceived lacks is a lack of love. A perceived lack of love. You don't have to raise your hand, but I think there's a number of people under, under my voice right now who in seasons of life have felt unlovable. Maybe because of mistakes that you've made, decisions that you've made. Some of you, there are people who are feel, feel unlovable because of their physical appearance. They feel unlovable because of the, 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 the failed relationships that they've been in. They feel unlovable because uh, they didn't see love modeled well for them in their upbringing, or, or they feel unlovable because, because of, of, of thoughts and, and things that have been said to them because wounds in their heart and wounds in their life. And they feel this perceived lack of love. So when we look at all this, we wonder, okay, well, then what's the solution? What's the solution to this loneliness if, if if, if God is good and God is for us, what's the solution to this loneliness? If, this is a, if there are perceived lacks that maybe all of us can identify with at least one of these, if that's the perceived lack and God is good, then what's the solution? And we look back at the original passage and we see that it says in Psalm 68 that God puts the lonely in families. They address the word specifically. He puts the lonely in families. So God saw the solution being families. And for some of you, when I said that, that triggered something. You're like, not my family. Not the family I was put in. If that's a solution, I need another one. If that, yeah, I know you're sitting with your family, so you don't have to laugh. But we, we, you, 
If that's the solution, we're, we're in some trouble because these, these are, our earthly families can be dysfunctional. Our earthly families can have struggles. Our earthly families can actually be some of the, the wound givers that land us in some of this condition of loneliness. So how, how can that be the solution? Well, let me give you a little, little, little context on, on that Psalm 68 moment. See, the, the writer is talking about all the way back when the children of Israel were, were in, in captivity in Egypt. And what they did, and this is, this is a whole nother message, Abby, whole nother message. It's a great thing. When, when, they were, when they were in Egypt, the Egyptian leaders would separate families so they can separate power. They knew if they can, if they can take away son from father and daughter from mother and, 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 and daughter from father and, 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 and remove generations and remove family lineage, that they could actually remove the power. Isn't it interesting that there's such an attack on the, on the family unit these days? It's a whole nother message, Nick. I wish I could do it, but I'm gonna just keep going. But, they, but what happened was after, after that, once, once, once the, the, the Israelites were, were freed from Egypt, what the writer's talking about is how they began to put families back together. They began to restore the family model from a, from a natural sense. And in a literal sense, they began to restore the family model. That's why it's so important that you realize all of the different clans were based on family. Right, all the generational lineage. All that, that, I know, guys, when you read Matthew chapter one, it, it doesn't seem that you, you wanna skip it because begat, 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 and son, 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 son. It all matters so much. But, but it began to restore the family unit because families meant that much. But see, when it comes to the restoration of our heart and our minds and our soul, our nuclear earthly family can't be the solution. So what did God do? to put the lonely in families, and it says in Ephesians, which is, this is in the New Testament, this is after the life of Jesus was, that was lived and after his death, burial, and resurrection, and it says this in Ephesians chapter one. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. Even before we made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family. God puts the lonely in families. God decided to adopt us in his own family. God puts the lonely in families. God decided to adopt us in his own family. My mom and dad failed, my siblings failed me, but God decided to put us into his own family. And how? By bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. God puts the lonely in families, and the way he puts the lonely in families by drawing you to himself. God says, I'm the greatest family you could ever have. My kingdom is the greatest family you could ever have. My house is the greatest family you could ever have. God puts the lonely in families, and he did that through the sacrifice of Jesus, the perfect life lived of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the grace of Jesus, the love of Jesus drew you to him. You did never, there's not a person in this room that chose God. God chose you. There's not a person in, and, and Pastor, Pastor Buddy already, already mentioned it, there's not a person in here who deserved Jesus, who earned Jesus, but before the foundation of the earth, God said, I, 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 want, I want you. Yeah, you're gonna struggle. Yeah, you're gonna have challenges. Yeah, you're gonna have to live in an imperfect world, but I'm a perfect God and I want you to be a part of my family and part of my kingdom. And God put the lonely in families. But see, that word adoption, that word adoption is interesting to me. Because see, I'm, I, I don't, that, that word has never resonated too much with me because I, I grew up raised by my parents. I, 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 don't, I don't know if that, I, I don't want you to say that the adoption didn't mean as much to me if, if that's, your family has some type of history uh, with that. But, but then I had the opportunity to go to, an event. See, there's this little girl in our church. She's a, she's a teen now by the name of Estrella. And see, Estrella came to our church by way of a group home. She came to our church by way of a group home. And you see, uh, that group home, the foster care group home comes every Wednesday and they come to our youth service. They come to every Sunday and they participate. And, and it's been great to see even Estrella. I got to see her surrender her life to Jesus even while living in that group home. I got to, to see her uh, go, go into water baptism and get baptized in the Holy Spirit and, and go to our camps and go to our conferences all by way through that group home. But then there was a family. And there was a family, a preschool director and her husband. They saw her in a different light than everyone else. And they asked permission from the group home and they asked permission from the kids' church worker. They said, can we, can we invite that little girl to our house for lunch? And she went over for lunch. And then she started hanging out more over there after school. And then she started spending the night. 
and God moved on their heart. They were praying about next moves for their family and God moved on their heart and they said, we want, we want to adopt that little girl. We want to make that girl part of our family. And I thought it was an incredible, beautiful thing. I thought it was a great full circle story, but there was so much more to it because you see, I had the opportunity to be there for the final moments of the adoption ceremony. And I don't know if you've ever, guys, have ever been in the courtroom when an adoption becomes final, but it's a powerful moment. You see this judge reads this statement on these people who weren't family and now become family. And there's just, and, and what I'm looking at, I'm seeing this father with tears in his eyes. And I see this mother with tears in her eyes and this little girl who's been abandoned with tears in her eyes as they become a family. And this is the statement that was read. And the statement's researchable if you want to look up Arizona adoption. And it says, on entry of the decree of adoption, the relationship of parent and child and all the legal rights, privileges, duties, and obligations and other legal consequences of the natural relationship of child and parent thereafter exist between the adopted child and the adoptive parent as though the child were born to the adoptive family in lawful wedlock. The adopted child is entitled to inherit real and personal property from and through the adoptive parent, and the adoptive parent is entitled to inherit real and personal property from and through the adopted child, the same as though if the child were born to the adoptive parent in wedlock. You see, there's, you can't convince me that Estrella at that point, at 12 years old, after bouncing around from, from nine different foster homes and, and nine different, a, a total of nine different stops in her 12 years of life, you can't tell me that she wasn't experiencing a lack of acceptance. You can't tell me she didn't experience a lack of attention. You can't tell me she didn't experience a lack of intimacy, a lack of value, a lack of love. But that judge had power. And what that judge declared is, yeah, you may have a history of that, but what I declare today is that now you have a father, now you have a mother, now you can experience a true love, a true acceptance, a reminder that you are cared for. And it was such a beautiful thing that when I hear this adopted, it's like, yeah, just the way that Jesus, that God adopted us in his family through Jesus. Yeah, we, we, every single one of us in this room have a history prior to Jesus. None of us were born following and loving Jesus. We all have a story prior to Jesus. But because of Jesus, because God adopting us into his family, we can look back and say, yeah, that there, there was a moment. Yeah, there was a time. Yeah, there was the thoughts. But now that I'm adopted into the family of God, I no longer have to ever identify as that. I no longer have to carry that. I no longer have to walk in that. I invite you to stand as we close. Because you see, I can't help but wonder, what would it be like? What would it be like if this was all red for Estrella and Estrella's standing there and she sees this father that loves her, even though she probably didn't deserve it, didn't, couldn't, couldn't pay a dime, this father that loves her. And the father says, I want you to be mine. I wanna give you a loving home. I've already let you experience some of the goodness and there, I've got so much more for you. Imagine if Estrella looked at that and said, you know what, I'm still on my journey. Maybe, maybe, maybe I, I wanna test the waters in some other areas first before, before I say yes to that loving home and that loving future. We would call that absolutely crazy. We would say, you've, you've gotta take that step. You go there, that is, that is, that's, that's, that's the future you've been dreaming about. That's what you've been praying about. That's what you've been hoping for. That's, that's the things you've been crying about right there, that home, that loving home, that family. But from Sunday to Sunday, Wednesday to Wednesday, day and night, so often people hear the good news of this family of the Lord that they can be in and they say, let me go try a few other things. And I'm asking you this morning, don't be that one. Don't be the one that says, I, I, I hear the offer and I hear the goodness of it and I am starting to believe that I was drawn to this, but let me, let's wait, let's pause. See, because the word is so full of acceptance and attention and intimacy and value and love for you. I can read off so many different verses, but I think what I'd rather tell you right now is that there's a, there's a God that, that loves you for how you are, for who you are. There's a God that, that, that chose you as is. There's a God that, that said, I know your every thought, your every flaw, your every struggle. I know the, actually the parent that gave you that wound and I know I didn't dictate for them to do that, but it happened, but I can heal it. I know about the abuse. I know about the addiction and I love you and I still wanna draw you into myself. 
So I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads. If you're in here this morning and you're saying that you, you wanna make a decision for Jesus, you wanna accept that sacrifice that was made for you as Jesus died on the cross in your place, gave his life for you, shed his blood for you, and rose again just like he said he would. If that's, that's you today and you've never made that decision once and for all to, to say yes to Jesus, I'm gonna ask you just right now to raise your hand if that's you. Raise your hand if that's you. If the Holy Spirit's drawing you to him, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. And I wanna pray for one more group. If there's anyone in here today and eyes are closed and we're, we're being mindful of everyone, if you can say, I, I've been... I've been battling that loneliness. I've been, I've been in a condition of loneliness way longer than I wanna be. I'm gonna ask you if you're, if you're willing to raise your hand right where you are, raise your hand right where you are. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you all over the room. Lord, you see every hand. Lord, I thank you that the power of your spirit is ministering right now, that the power of your spirit is setting people free right now, that the power of your love is reminding people that you have made us family, that you have drawn us to yourself. I pray, Lord, for every wound for every bit of pain, for every painful memory, for every thought, for every lie from the enemy. I pray that it is healed right now in the name of Jesus. I pray restoration on people's hearts and minds. I pray, Lord, that not only as you take us into your family and the kingdom, that this church body will surround people and truly be, truly be a house of family, a house of prayer, a house of love that people can, can enjoy and thrive in. Lord, for those who, who battle the loneliness and have a fear of reaching out, have a fear of surrounding themselves. Lord, I pray that you urge them to join a life group, to reach out to a mentor. Lord, I pray you surround them with friends. And more than anything else, Lord, I pray they fall in love with your presence. We love you, Lord. We're here to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Tyrone, for that incredible word. Church, don't be fooled uh, by the, the, the presence or the, the lack that comes in your life, but know that in Christ, he is everything that we need. He's everything we need. Uh, so I'm gonna pray, and as I pray, if uh, after you're dismissed, but if you need to uh, have more prayer, we have our prayer team up front. They would love to pray with you and agree with you on the things that God has for you. But before we do that, if you were that one that raised your hand, uh, if you will, stop by our, our table out front, the information table. We have a book that we would love to give to you called Fresh Start. It will help you on your next kind of steps in your faith journey. While you're there, go ahead and sign up for water baptism on March the 6th. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. And Lord, we know that in you we find all that we need. So God, when those moments of lack come and creep in and the lies of Satan come in our lives, God, may, may we be reminded of your love that you have for us, God, and may we just lean on you. May we trust in you, God, that you have a plan, purpose for us, a plan for us, God, and you are all that we need. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen, amen.